Hello and welcome, welcome to the channel. My name is Kubair. I'm a CICC licensed immigration consultant and this channel is all about Canadian immigration news, trends, updates, things you should do and things you certainly definitely should not with regards to Canadian immigration. And if Canada is on your mind, if you're thinking about Canada, Canada to live, work, immigrate, uh, visit, study or whatever else that's coming to your mind, well then, you know where to subscribe, what channel to subscribe and of course what to do with it. Uh, Another episode, another lovely Saturday morning, and I'm streaming this live from our new office in Dubai. So if you're in Dubai, you're most welcome. The address, I'm sure we will post it in the description. I haven't posted it yet, but we are in one central near Dubai World Trade Center, level three. So by all means, if you're here in the vicinity, do give us a shout, come and, and have a cup of coffee with us. Today, we are going to talk about Again, the regular updates, whatever has happened. This week has been pretty cool. Nothing much to, to report as far as the immigration is concerned. Mark Miller also has been quite quiet. Uh, Trudeau, obviously, uh, or rather, Christian Freeland, Freeland uh, announced the budgets for, for uh, 2024, which has been a bit you know tepid, to be, to be very honest. Uh, nothing much to talk about, nothing much to, to write home about, uh, but small news here and there, tidbits we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, of course, the Express Entry because we, we love to talk about Express Entry. Uh, and the hot topic for today, reverse migration. Uh, why Canada, right? I mean, with all these negative press that Canada has been getting lately, uh, you know, the, the car thefts, uh, the uh, housing crisis, the increase in number of the asylum seekers, the... Uh, Tell me some more, right? I'm sure you guys know the housing prices, the housing crisis, the inflation, the food cost, of course, the lack of jobs. And I am not even going to go anywhere near what's happening with the express entry scores or, or the way the pathways of for, for immigration are, are closing down. With all that, with all of that, deep sigh of relief from there. No, not relief, but deep sigh. But uh, I'm going to talk about all of that as well, reverse, reverse migration, as in how many people are leaving, what they're thinking. And somebody said the weather, of course. Yeah, what's what's there to you know be happy about the weather? As of right now, actually, the weather is pretty cool. So yeah, a, a lot to, to, to praise as far as Canada is concerned in terms of the weather and be thankful for. But we're going to talk about all of that as we move forward. But to start with, let's get cracking with this one. Uh, and this is our weekly roundup. So please do subscribe to the channel share uh, and like and do all of that that you're supposed to do and uh, let's see topics of discussion we have the pnps and the updates we are going to talk about express entry we have some little bit teeny bit of other news as well uh, in pnp draws nothing much happened except the regular suspect that we have the usual suspect british columbia they have uh, conducted a draw on the 16th of april they issued 39 total invitations in a general draw only 39 so that's where the problems come and all but one of the five above streams candidates required a minimum score of 132. Wow, that is mighty high. Uh, as far as BCPNP is concerned, I mean, like, come on, 132. Uh, <laughs> but there was uh, entry level and semi skilled candidates for them. The score was 107. These draws saw candidates from four different occupational categories receiving a total of at least 40 invitations. So specific categories were also invited. They received invitations, about 40 of them. Overall, with BCPNP, uh, I'm sure by all, by now you already are aware, is that uh, you need a job offer, right? And if you need a job offer, and, and we all know how the job offer situation is at this point of time, but you need a job offer. Uh, another breakdown, but of course, if you were interested in BC and if you are already there, then you already know the draw, right? And, and you would have already received the invitation. But 12 were received to child care occupations. Score has gone up to 92. Can you imagine those good old days? Just a few months back, it was only 60. Uh, occupation in construction, 97 was the score. 10, 10 invitations there. 18 were sent to healthcare occupations. Score of 92. Again shot up from 60, which was quite a norm few days, a uh, few months back. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically what BCPNP was. Prince Edward Islands on the 18th also conducted the draw. They issued 82 uh, invitations. Uh, they usually announce their draws pretty much uh, ahead in time. I, I, I like that, right? I mean, if you already know which province is going to conduct a draw at what point of time, that makes your life so much easy, right? In terms of anxiety and expectations. Uh, but the thing with PEI 
is that, yes, of course, everyone, anybody can go and create their profile on the PEI portal. The only thing with PEI is that they usually prefer to invite candidates from inside the province, not many people from outside. So that's the that's the catch there, if at all you ever wanted to consider uh, PEI. What else is happening here? Uh, okay. As we move forward, Express Entry. Well, don't worry, nothing has happened in Express Entry. Of course, if you if there was something there, then all of us would already know what, what's going on with Express Entry. Just to backtrack a bit, bit uh, 10th of April, which was a couple of weeks, already, already a couple of weeks back, the invitations for a general draw was uh, 1280 invitations with a high, 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 hot high score of 549. Followed by 11th of April draw, much awaited draw of STEM occupations, STEM categories, category based draws. 4,500 invitations issued, but the score remained high. When I'm saying high, uh, I'm talking about expectations, right? The last draw in December where 5,900 invi 5, invitations were issued, score was 481. With this one, it was 491, of course. Uh, a few people were still disappointed, right? I mean, of course, a lot of you rejoiced, but 491 was the draw with that. Now, what happens with a draw like this, especially with STEM category draw, is that now all eyes are out for OINP, Ontario's tech draw. Why? Because we all expect that Ontario's tech draw would now be at a cutoff, which will be one point less, which you now by now already know it would be about at 490. That's the expectation uh, going with how Ontario normally usually conducts a draw. So if it's at 490 on the top, depending on how many invitations they want to issue. Mind you, Ontario's nominations uh, target for this year has gone up by 5,000. A lot of nominations there. So if it has gone up by 5,000, of course, we all expect that all there is going to be a cascading effect of higher number of invitations for all different programs that Ontario invites. So looking forward to more draws with Ontario's tech, Ontario's healthcare, uh, skilled trade, of course, the international student, foreign workers, masters, PhD, it basically will get spread out with all these uh, programs. So yes, I'm sure a lot of you are expecting the Ontario tech draw now. Uh, as I said, high cutoff at 490. The low cutoff, we don't know uh, because it all depends on how many invitations Ontario wants to issue. But yes, we will keep our eyes open for that one as that one happens. Uh, that's That's basically for the draws categories, draws, IRCC, very, very quick look at the, where is that? Yeah, let's take a very quick look at the pool breakdown, if you don't mind me doing this. Uh, yeah, so pool breakdown is, let me just increase the size so that we have a better view of this. There you go. What's it looking like? 601 to 1200, 1093, 501 to 600 at 12,051. Now, of course, uh, this is as of 9th of April. There was a draw on the 10th. So all 1093 have cleared out. Between 501 to 600, I don't think there was big change. I mean, only what, a couple of, couple hundred people got invited there. So you would see a similar number probably higher with the next draw as we anticipate or expect for this week. When I'm saying this week, I mean, what date are we going to expect the draws on? Uh, okay. Any days from 22, 23, 24, 25, all these days are now open because IRCC no longer sticks to the regular Wednesday draws. It could happen on Monday, Tuesday, or any other day of the week. So uh, 501 to 600, you have 12,000 people uh, as of this number. But then again, few people were expected to be cleared out because there was a draw of approximately uh, 5,500. So 1280 for general and then another 4,500 for uh, STEM. So you would have you would see some of this movement over here. But then again, because almost 10 days have passed today, so two weeks draw difference, you would see some more new profiles adding up as well. So I don't expect a big dent on the numbers here. So I would say probably 11,000, 11,000 ish is what you're going to be looking at. Uh, what are we expecting next week? <sighs> Tricky one to answer, but I would say probably expecting a straight category, if at all that might happen. Uh, general draw, of course, that's that's always fingers crossed and that's always hoping. But it's about time that IRCC conducts a regular, regular draw. When I'm saying regular means regular means regular category draw, but regular as in 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 kind of, you know, 
hopeful, of course, forever hopeful. That's that's how we roll. Uh, but with that, at least there would be some movement, you know, with so much of disappointment that's happening across, there would be at least some movement, some some breath of you know relief, size of relief. That's that's what we're looking forward to. Let's see how it they, they roll it out this week. I wouldn't put Francophone out of the radar either. That, of course, by now we already know is, is quite a hot favorite within the categories. Uh, so yeah, Francophone is a possibility. Trades is a possibility. Of course, general draw is something which, which we anticipate anyways. Uh, healthcare, that can also happen uh, this week. Not too gung-ho for this week with, with transport and agriculture. Of course, you know, because those numbers are always going to be kept low and therefore don't expect too many draws with this. But by and large, as far as the category draws are concerned, by now you already know what to anticipate in the sense like expect like trade, healthcare, they probably will get spread out like once every three months or four months, depending on how many invitations they want to issue. Now, if they're going to be issuing large draws or they're going to be issuing large size invitations, for example, with STEM, they did in December 5,900. Now they have done 4,500. With healthcare, if they're doing 3,000, 4,000 kind of invitations. So don't expect too many draws for these categories. Expect them to be spread out. Uh, of course, we can always be hopeful that they do a back-to-back -back kind of a thing, right? And, and clear out a bigger chunk. Uh, but going with the market sentiment right now, going with the market conditions, as in how the job conditions are there or, or the employment conditions are there in Canada, I, am, I, I would play it a bit more realistically and say, expect it to be more spread out than club together. Uh, but of course, we can, we can dance and sing if they do happen back to back and more number of draws happen. But overall, that is the outlook as we move into this week of 21st of April. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, that's it, I think. Uh, no, we do have something here. Other news. Let's talk about other news. And this other news is not very good, right? Nova Scotia has again, when I'm saying again, because they do tend to sort of restrict certain occupations as in how uh, the demand for certain ap application types go. Now, it's a well-known and it's, a, it's an understood thing that food services has the largest number of uh, uh, international students and people who are looking at the entry-level jobs. So you will always have a bigger chunk of candidates who will take up the jobs in, in factories, in, in the food service industry. So what Nova Scotia has done is as of 12 noon ADT, uh, April of 17th, Nova Scotia nominee program has, a, because they have a significant, significant volume of applications for candidates in the accommodation and food services sector, Therefore, they have stopped accepting applications in this sector while they are processing their current inventory. Now, no date given as to when they will lift this pause, but this is going to be a severe setback for so many of you out there who had decided to move to Nova Scotia from Ontario or from any other place because you were anticipating that that PNP program is going to be faster and easier. Uh, it's it's a well-known fact, right? With with OINP not being the most helpful with employer form requirement kind of a thing, uh, expository scores not being in your favor, a lot of international students, especially the ones who had come to Canada after completing their grade 12, right? So they were fresh out of school in Canada. They did a two-year diploma in Canada. After that, don't have too many options with that, right? Uh, employer job form not being the most easy to get. Express entry scores not being very good, especially with these guys, because education points are not going to add up really there. So with that and very limited options, I think a lot of you were making way towards the Atlantic provinces. And with that, when you go to Atlantic provinces, you, you have a dual uh, benefit in the sense you can have the PNP from that specific province, in this case, Nova Scotia. Plus, you also have the option through the AIP, Atlantic Immigration Program. And with that in mind, a lot of people were making way towards Nova Scotia. And now with this, this, this is a huge setback. A lot of them are going to be really, really disappointed. But also, mind you, if Nova Scotia has done it, expect, I mean, don't be shocked, don't be surprised if other provinces might also not do the same thing. Alberta is known to restrict provinces. Hey, Alberta has, at this point of time, put a complete stop to their Alberta opportunity stream. But you can expect similar restrictions in different provinces as in how we tread forward because there is only so many nominations they can give out and obviously they would want to spread them out over different sectors, different segments, different uh, occupations. So don't be shocked, don't be surprised if you see a similar one happening with uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, 
uh, Prince Edward Islands, uh, New Brunswick. So if you're looking at those programs, if you're eyeing them, please, without fail, get your get your applications in. Don't wait for a different date. Don't wait for some muhurat if, you, if you're looking for that. So get your applications in at the, at the earliest. Now, what is accommodation and food services sector? Because a lot of people are confused with that. So I have just for your sake got that screenshot on your screens. Uh, it says... And this accommodation and food services sector. They, so Nova Scotia has not identified any knock codes in that. They have just identified the North American Industry Classification System Code, NAICS code, that is under accommodation and food services sector, starts with 72. This is not a knock code, guys. Not a knock code, 72. I'm not saying 72 knock codes. This is the NAICS codes, but it tells you that this sector comprises of establishments primarily engaged in providing short-term lodging and complimentary services to travelers, vacationers and others. So basically all your hotels and motels kind of a thing in facilities such as hotels, motels, resorts, casino hotels, bed and breakfast accommodations, housekeeping cottages and cabins, recreational vehicle parks and campgrounds uh, and all the other uh, <laughs> institutions that you're looking at. This sector also comprises establishments primarily engaged in preparing meals, snacks, and beverages to customer orders for immediate consumptions on and off the premises. That's the bad one. That probably means all restaurants, all fast foods, all, all, all fast food services. It pretty much is all of them. So these 72 category codes of the NAICS, not the NOC code, includes the accommodation services and all food services and drinking places. So there you go. That's the Nova Scotia latest restrictions under their skilled worker uh, category. It has now been put on hold until the next update, whenever that will happen. That's basically it for the weekly roundup. Connect with us on the social media platforms, basically everywhere. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, TikTok. Hey, give us some love on the Instagram handle for Dubai as well. We just launched a new one on the Dubai channel. So it's Ask Uber Dubai. I haven't got it written anywhere. My bad. But yes, Ask Uber Dubai. I'm sure you can find that very easily on Instagram. Show us some love there. You know, join us there. Some hot things coming out, especially if you are in Dubai. We'll be talking more about how Dubai is of importance or of impact when it comes to the immigration programs and since we are the canadian specialists and that's all we do we do not do the new zealands and the australias and the polands and the portugals we, we, we want to just specialize only with canada because that's what we love but today's hot topic hot 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 and that is reverse migration what are we thinking what are we talking i want to see some comments i want to see some nice juicy comments please don't don't keep it with the cliched statements oh because of this and because of that let's 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 hear it from you guys and what do you think why is the reverse migration happening is it really happening first of all or is it just because when when we say about reverse migration it is but natural it's but obvious that there will always be that small segment of people who will move back after coming to canada right they with this it's always going to happen but has it become a big phenomenon now? Has it become a, a, a thing which is now becoming quite normal or something which people are realizing which they otherwise did not? Uh, there you go. Let's take one comment. Karthi says, we are new to Canada and moving back to India. Canada is not a big market. I don't want golden prison. I want to live in, a, in the reality life. This is artificial. Here, all people are slaves of corporate. Interesting comment. I mean, of course, I would have so many things to say to this uh, because I, I beg to differ, right? But the problem here is, if I was to if I if I was to express my opinion and differ, then everybody will say, "Ye to agent hai, ye to consultant hai, iska to bhanda hai, iska to business hai." You will say all those things that I am a consultant, and obviously, I'll be biased. Partly that is true, of course, right? I mean, why why why, why not cut to the chase? But that's not entirely true. Uh, I did not first become consultant and then come to Canada. I came to Canada, fell in love, and then became a consultant. So uh, there is a little bit of bias, business bias, as well as the love bias there. But I want to hear more comments and see what you guys are thinking in terms of the reverse migration. Is it really there that as bad as it's as it's looking like? Have you seen any of your friends, relatives, somebody who you know, somebody who you know firsthand who has moved back to their country, or the home country, or wherever they came from? Uh, are you seeing that? Let's let's see that.
Okay, this is another one. Uh, Sheva says, most people don't even know why they want to move abroad. Those are the people who complain about doing their own laundry, cooking by themselves and realizing that there is no VIP culture here. Well, well, fair point. Uh, then we have another one from Shivam. He says, yes, it's happening. I'm not talking about well-settled families back home. I'm talking about people who's taken reverse mortgages on their homes <laughs> because they're not able to get their PR. Well, fair point there as well. Angel says, reverse migration is because people don't read the complete book, book and just flip the pages and jump on deciding to move. I absolutely agree on this one. But, and this is also so true, right? And, and I've been saying this, is Canada your shiny object? Are you suffering from the shiny object syndrome? For example, right? You all, I'm 100% sure, you all have mobile phones. You all have laptops. You all have television. Have you ever seen the... Uh, the Black Friday sales and the photographs and the images that you see of the Black Friday sales, for some reason, people hoard on televisions. I mean, don't you guys already have a television? You still need to go and buy another one, okay? Same thing with mobile phones. Every year, each manufacturer comes up with a new phone because they want to, they want to capitalize, they want to cash in on your shiny object syndrome. Naya hai to behtar hai. It's one of those, right? The Indian taglines that go with it. If it's new, it, it has to be better. That kind of a thing. And every time what happens is that you have a perfectly working mobile phone. Nothing wrong with it. It's actually working fantastic. But because there is a new one, Naya iPhone, new iPhone, uh, new Samsung, uh, new whatever other brand you prefer. Because there's a new one, you want to get that one because you feel that one is a better one. Same thing with the car. Same thing with so many other things around. So was Canada that shiny object for you you know shiny object which just attracts your attention and you just want to do it also what happened is and what has been happening over the last five six seven years so canada has always been a, 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 a migration destination for i do not know how long now more than a almost more than a century now right uh it was always a migration destination. Uh, most people in Canada, whether they like it or not, are migrants. Uh, they've all migrated from one or the other country in the world. They were not born. When I'm saying born, I mean, they are not natives to Canada by itself. But most of them, whoever, who even claim otherwise, would have forgotten that they're all immigrants. Now, the point is, because Canada has always been a, a migration destination, over the last five, six, seven years, as and how things became difficult, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, USA is out of out of you know uh, scope for most of you out there. I know most of you actually would want to go to the US, but it's out of your scope. Uh, and because it's outside your reach and you can't really get to it, there aren't too many options. Yes, the new kids on the block are uh, uh, Germany, and then you have uh, I think uh, Finland. I think Norway and Sweden are also running some programs, and I'm also hearing Japan. Are now Japan is also now opening up. So there are these new kids on the block, but not all of them are easy to get through to. They all will have certain challenges, but Canada has always been up there in the sense of, for, for a long time, it was the top destination. As of right now, it has fallen out of favor for different reasons, but whatever it was, and over the last five, six, seven years, it made the headlines. It was on every single you know headline on the newspapers, Canada needs people, and ever since Sean, Sean Fraser came in, and then earlier Marco Mendicino was here, and then you had those headlines, right, where um, one million people were required in Canada, or Canada needs people desperately, and Times of India, Hindustan Times, or all the Economic Times, etc., especially in India, and of course in, in Pakistan and certain other newspapers, other, other countries as well, you saw all those headlines as if Canada is desperate for people, and you know, I, now that I'm in Dubai, I understand there are apparently, apparently 3,000 immigration agents who are set up here. So all of this cashed in onto that, that gold rush that Canada was inviting. Because it got so much of attention over the last five, six years, uh, there was bound to be people who were just jumping onto the bandwagon without actually... As this person says, reading the complete book, they were just flipping the pages. They just saw some nice, pretty pictures without reading the entire paragraph, without reading, the, doing their research. They jumped onto the bandwagon, found the whole program easy. Well, hey, you know what? 31st of May, the score was only 413. Can you beat that? 413 was the lowest score for federal skilled workers outside Canada. Uh, 
people jumping onto the bandwagon, then the, the, the programs being sold, the study per programs being sold, study permit programs being sold as pathways for permanent residents, come to Canada on a visit visa, get to the LMIA, become PR that easily. Hey, TR to PR, I'm sure most of you remember, most of you are quite gung-ho about that one still. Then the 75 CRS, all of these things over a period of time attracted huge, huge numbers of people. Of course, whenever something like this would happen, there have to be repercussions, uh, which we are facing now. But then some other good comments here as well. Let's see. Uh, okay, there's another one. Sham says, you cannot expect things to be put on the plate for you. Most people who come here think of this as a shortcut. But in, in reality, it's tough to get into the job market. People just give up early. Well, that's interesting. I think it's mostly people who left a laid back life and came here not prepared or aware of what the Canadian journey looks like. That's another interesting comment there. Uh, Canada has more immigrants than it can absorb. Oh, don't agree with that one. Uh, so there should there should be. A, so this one is obviously on this side of the uh, of the room. There should be a pause on immigration or it should be limited to some extent from now on. OK. Uh, there's another one. Canada wants reverse, reverse migration, and that is evident in the express entry draws. No, that's not true. Express entry draws are not showing reverse migration. Express entry draws are just showing you that they have become selective in who they want to bring into the country. It's, it's, it's not that the numbers are not in your favor. So uh, oh, there's another one. People do reverse migration only after getting the passport, so they have a way to get back into the uh, into the country in future. There's another one. Yes, it's uh, it's definitely happening. High interest rates, high cost of living, uh, great development in India. It's pretty obvious. Okay, not sure if it's happening, but I came from Dubai thinking grass is greener on the other side. But I feel like it was much, 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 much better in Dubai. No income tax, low rents, car, low car insurance, better safety. Wow, so many different thoughts, different uh, uh, ideas, different opinions. You know what? All of them are valid. And and I posted this on Facebook yesterday. I posted this on Twitter as well. And fair comments came from all directions as far as that was concerned as well. Whether reverse migration is fair, not fair, I am not the one to, to, to say that. Because as I said, each one has absolute good point of view based on their own uh, circumstances based on their own situation now when i'm now, now that i'm in dubai right uh, and i'm sure all of you have already seen those images and those pictures about the rains uh, the, the last two three days uh, the, this this city has been uh, you know in, in the midst of a total havoc with all that rain and the half the city being submerged and what a bad press they got for all of that but uh, to give the credit where it's due, they've managed to clear the city up and, and it's back on its feet, up and about, all uh, back to doing what it was doing. For people in Dubai who are here, uh, for some reason, Canada is a very huge draw. Even now, I, I have set up business in, in, in Dubai, right? So there has to be a reason for that. So you, you have a huge client base or prospective client base. But the point is, if you are used to living in Dubai, you are used to living a certain lifestyle. You're used to access to domestic help, you're used to uh, access to uh, very, uh, fr I wouldn't say free, very easy debt from the banks, the credit cards, etc, etc. Uh, uh, the job market is, is I wouldn't say stable as a such, but the job market is, is open for you to get your hands into. And it's pretty comparative in terms of India or Pakistan for that. When I'm saying comparative, I mean, if you are a manager in India, uh, you pretty much can start at a similar or maybe one level down in, in Dubai and then work from there on. In comparison, if you come to, if you talk about Canada, uh, debt, when I'm saying debt, I mean bank loans, credit cards, it's not easy to get. I mean, as a newcomer, you know, you, you get credit cards only uh, starting at a credit limit of $1,000. Ridiculous, right? $1,000, dollars $2,000. In Dubai, they give you uh, credit cards of $50,000 easily as if they're, you know, handing out uh, charity here. So uh, the debt is harder to get, but then that is because of the conservative banking system. Secondly, the costing, the costs of housing has gone through the roof okay uh, yes uh, a lot of it was being blamed on the high number of international students and the num but then again i blame it on the governance and poor policies and poor uh, 
poor uh, planning rather than people. Don't blame it on the people, blame it on the system. But so high cost of housing, you, uh, affordability, absolutely. People just cannot look forward to affording their own houses. Rents, of course, because the housing itself is, is scarce. So the rents are also beyond most people's uh, reach. Uh, that has then led to you know shared accommodations and, and those kind of issues. Brampton has now introduced a new license if you need to sort of rent your houses. Uh, and the most recent one, which is getting Canada a real, real bad press, is the auto theft, right? I mean, you, you leave your car for a few minutes and your car is gone. And the carjacking as well. The minute somebody knocks on your car like this, talk, 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 uh, you get so scared that you just walk out of your car and you hand them over the keys. The Toronto police said that, you know, just if you if somebody is doing this, just hand over your keys kind of a thing. So with all that kind of bad press and let me not even get started with the high taxes. I guess one of the biggest shocks that people get when they come to Canada is that they don't realize how big a component the tax forms in your paycheck. So you might be saying, okay, I'm getting a salary of $80,000 and you're thinking in your mind, you'll be getting like six, $7,000 a month. But when the time you get your paycheck, it's less than 5,000 and you're like, what the hell happened over here? So that it continues to be a big shock. The cost of you know living has gone up. The, the inflation is, is going up like crazy. Uh, you go for your groceries and suddenly you, you realize you've spent $100 and you haven't even filled a small box of groceries back home. So all of this is taking a severe toll on those people, actually quite a lot of people, not only people who are coming to Canada, but people who are living in Canada. I'm sure they're not happy with what how, how it's happening. I'm talking about people who have been living here for, centu for centuries, I was going to say, who have been living here for, for years together. Even they're finding difficult. But people who are coming who are just coming to Canada, they are the ones who are most affected with the shock that this is giving to them, right? Uh, but then sometimes I think, actually most of the times I think, why are you shocked? Social media, YouTube, I mean, all these platforms, the blogs, the newspapers, um, just a little bit of Google search can tell you what the cost of living in Canada is. There are so many calculators. You put in what you're expecting in terms of salary and it will run down what will be your tax deductions, what will you get in hand, what will be your rent kind of a thing, right? So if you're going to buy a new mobile phone today, you would search for 10 different things. You would ask 10 different people. You would probably, you know, go to the salesman or, or, or wherever you, or you'll do your research. You'll figure out, does it have the, 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 the required MBs? Does it charge fast? How, what colors is it available on? How many cameras? You would check for all of that. But when it comes to Canada and, and for you to make the biggest move of your life, you know, you're, you're uprooting yourself from one country, going into the next one. Aren't you researching well enough? Why are you shocked? I mean, didn't you know or is it that you just did not know how shocked you would be so you expected that yes it's going to hit you but you just did not know how hard or sometimes you expect that it's going to be difficult but when the reality hits you it hits you harder than what you expected therefore putting you in that state that this is not for me i did not sign up for this so hence the reverse migration and as somebody said the grass is greener on the other side well if you, if you jumped onto this bandwagon only because of the shiny object syndrome, hey, because chacha ka ladka, mame ka ladka, chacha taya, wo Canada mein hai, my friend is in Canada, my uncle is in Canada, my aunt is there, they all come and they talk about, you know, Canada, Canada, and I also want to go first world country, blah, blah, blah. If that is the reason why you came to Canada, then that definitely is going to put you in some sort of state of shock. But the point then is, if I go to my next slide here, if people are really rushing out or as people are painting it out to be or apparently there is one person who went back from Canada back to Punjab and he actually set up an agency uh, for reverse migration where apparently he answers three to four calls every day helping people to immigrate, migrate back. Fair enough. Uh, you identify a niche in the business and you can make good money out of it. So smart guy that one. But the point is if if there is really that number of people going out of Canada, I mean, of course there are, there always are going to be. But if there's such a large number of people who are leaving Canada, why is it then people still want to come to Canada? Why is it then uh, 
even now that in Dubai, people like me are setting up shops. We are still opening up businesses. Not only me, I can see so many others who are coming in. The number of agents still operating here, still thriving. As I said, 3,000 immigration agents in, in, in Dubai alone, right? Uh, why? Why is it that I mean, I, I know on, on Instagrams and on TikToks, I keep getting those, you know, ki mera business ho jayega, and I'm worried about the business. Thankfully, I'm not worried about the business, touch wood, uh, because there are, you know, other streams there as well. But why are people still then coming to Canada? Why is it that people like me uh, continue to thrive on this particular subject uh, with, with Canada being our business, with immigration being our business? Why is it that more and more and more immigration consultants, even in Canada, the licensed one, keep getting licensed, they keep jumping into this business, keep adding themselves uh, to this occupation and profession. Why? Where is this coming from? Where is the demand coming from if it is so difficult or if the life here is so difficult? So that is one thing which always, you know, uh, lights up that bulb in my head. No doubt about it that uh, your background matters as in where are you coming from? If you are coming from a very comfortable background, you were earning very well, you had all the domestic help, you had decent savings, you probably had a roof over your head, you had a car with a driver, you had domestic help who's looking after your cooking, cleaning, etc, etc. Uh, why did you make that uh, change? Why did you jump onto the Canadian bandwagon? Then you have to ask yourself because if you are really doing this well, then I'm assuming you have uh, that bandwidth here to do some research and, and to figure out what exactly you're going to face. Or if you are really doing this well, then at least you should have first come to Canada, taken a trip to Canada and seen if it is really all that that is all that jazz that people are claiming it to be. Is it really worth your time? Instead of then going through the process and then realizing, ooh, I made a mistake, let me go back. You know, I mean, then imagine you've wasted so much of your resources, so much of your time, and now you're, that, that regretful moment is not nice, right? Canada does tax you. They tax you really, really, really heavy. No doubt about it. Uh, I think with direct and indirect taxes, you're pretty much paying 40 to 50% of your paycheck. But you do get things in return. I, I, I'm not going to talk about the free healthcare bit. Of course, we do get free healthcare. And, and I know how many of you are going to cut my throat when I say free healthcare. It is really, you know, uh, free. But it is free, isn't it? Uh, whether you like it or not. Yes, the ERs are, are a pain in the backside. Uh, uh, the shortage of doctors, for example, in Nova Scotia and, and those uh, provinces is, is alarming. Uh, but it is free at the end of the day. So if you and, and people say, well, healthcare in, in India is so much better. Well, healthcare in Dubai is so much better. Well, of course it is. But then you're paying for it in most cases. And, and we all know uh, healthcare is such a huge business uh, in most cases. And you all knew what was happening during COVID. You, you all knew where and how things were being handled at that point of time. Uh, only money was talking, right? Uh, when it came to India and how the hospital beds uh, were being uh, charged at 3 lakhs, 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs kind of a thing. COVID beds, you've forgotten already or, or you're aware. Every time you go into a hospital, they will write you all kinds of tests and all kinds of things just to make sure that your bill keeps getting added up. I have so many stories to share in terms of how healthcare in Canada took such good care of some people who I really, really know on first-hand basis. Uh, somebody in my family is as well. And, and I'm so glad that I was in Canada or they were in Canada because they could avail that facility, which otherwise they wouldn't have been able to had they been back in their home countries. And we could have pretty much lost some of our loved ones there. But then that's, that's the reality of it all. Uh, schooling, so many people have, again, so many thoughts about schooling. Hey, but it's free. Like right now in Dubai, if I was to have a child going to grade 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and if I want to send them to any of the, uh, 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 your, uh, what do you call it, British curriculum or, or European curriculum schools, it costs almost 80,000 dirhams uh, a, a year, probably sometimes more than that. If I calculate how much that is going to put me by, if I have two or three children, oh my God, that's that's crazy. And then talk about, college education. Uh, you don't realize that as a permanent resident or a citizen in Canada, you pay one fourth of the fee that your international student is paying. Isn't that advantage enough? So if you actually start calculating all of these, they all add up. And then the child care benefits and then the carbon tax benefits and then the HST rebates, they go on and on and on. And I can't even talk about the Canadian passport and, and the access that it gives you in terms of uh, 
traveling around. But then again, you will say, I am biased. Well, I am biased only because I love it. Uh, I have lived, and I'm not coming out of only from India. So, of course, I was born and brought up in India. Then I have lived in Dubai. I have lived in Singapore. I have lived in Malaysia. I've lived in Myanmar, if you'll be, you'll be surprised with that one. I've spent pretty much a lot of time in, in the Gulf. And then, after all of this, I went to Dubai. So, yes, I know a, a bit or two about comfortable lifestyle, creature comforts, and domestic help, and all that, all that. Uh, I still love Dubai. And as I said, different people have different... Uh, circumstances different people have different expectations uh, for what they do i mean first time when i went to canada i didn't like it at all i didn't want it to be there it was a winter frozen land i wanted to pack up my bags and run from that place in the first flight i could uh, today i'm in dubai and i can't wait to wrap up my work over here so i can go back home which is which is canada right so it's it's a matter of perception it's a matter of uh, where you are coming from what your background is what your circumstances are what your expectations are and sometimes, as they say, right, uh, don't ask what, what what country can do for you. Ask what you can do for the country, which is so true. You know, our, 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 our leaders have said that. Such a beautiful quote. And, and of course, it is in reference to India. But then again, uh, even when you talk about Canada for that matter, and, and I know we talk about uh, you found the grass to be greener and you expected Canada to do all this, this for you. But then you chose that country for a specific reason. And... If it is not giving you that, what you expected, then either you did not do your research well, or you were misguided, or you basically were, were having unrealistic expectations. And as somebody said, certain things take time. It's not like it's going to happen like this. It's not like when I landed in Canada and suddenly I became a consultant and suddenly, you know, I, I was able to put food on the table. It wasn't like that. I My first business that I set up in Canada, it blew up. I... I, I my investors who had faith in me and they put in so much of money on that business within six months, I was finished, gone. I was like uh, nothing to, to, to fall back on. And after that, the first job that I took was of a food delivery. And mind you, this is me coming out of a job as a vice president in a very senior aviation organization, largest, one of the biggest airports in the world, and then being on the board of directors for certain uh, companies with as an angel investors, financial boards. After all of that, um, taking up a job at a $6 per hour salary. Uh, I will not name the institution. And that's how they were, because they expected us to get tips from delivering food. I did that. I mean, yeah, I didn't like it in the beginning, but I did that, learned a lot of things. And then I did something else and then something else. And then out of the blues, I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I never thought I was going to be an immigration consultant, but here I am. Life teaches you a lot of things. Choices that you make, those happen to teach you a lot of things. And sometimes you love the choices you make. Sometimes you learn from the mistakes you have made. And sometimes you should learn from the mistakes other people have made. And if you learn from that, you probably will not fall into the shiny object syndrome and probably will do your research well, have realistic expectations, and then do what needs to be done to make Canada your home, if that's what you wish to do. But... This subject of reverse migration will always continue. It will always draw both sides of the argument. I'm not saying what I am saying is true or what I'm saying is correct. I'm not, I, won't, I won't try to sell you that. Uh, somebody just said Canada is a pyramid scheme, as I'm saying. Each to their own. It, it depends. If it was a pyramid scheme, which portion of the pyramid did you buy into and why? Okay. So that you have to first be honest with yourself. You have to sort of, you know, <laughs> look inside it look inwards and identify why is it a pyramid scheme and why are you part of it how did you manage to fall into that trap uh, so if it goes on and on and on uh, yeah okay I will just take that last one and then we off we go to the other things Canada is part of North America we brown people are obsessed with the fact that West is the best so Canadian dreams for all those who are desperate to live in Canada are not actually going after a Canadian dream instead they are influenced by social media and have believed that the moment they enter the country they will achieve something huge ground reality is different and this Canadian dream thing is not new before easy Canadian immigration people back in 90s were influenced well of course that 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 holds a bit of truth, of course. Uh, it's it's probably the way we were brought up. It's probably the way we were exposed while we were growing up. Uh, the things that attracted us, the things that we thought or we, we put value in, uh, and that's how you develop your mindset. But 
it's up to you that as you grow and as you mature to identify what is something that is good for you and what is something which you are just falling into a trap of. And at the end of the day, if in today's day and time with all the social media, with all this influencing, with all this gyan, with all these gurus, with all these mentors, with all this Google being at your finger at your fingertips and all this AI research that is happening, if you still cannot figure out what will work better for you and what will not, then I don't think you have to blame Canada for it. I think you need to sort of look inwards and you probably will go and stand in front of the mirror and you will find the culprit there. That being said, I rest my case here because I can't make a case here. As I said, it's a matter of perception. It's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of uh, you versus me, but it's not about you versus me. It is simply about you are right and so am I. We all have opinions. We all have circumstances. We all have backgrounds and we all continue to do what we think is best for us. And that's what we should. Therefore, this is a channel that you should be on if in Canada is on your mind to love, to love, of course, love, to, to visit work. Uh, what else do we do? Migrate, study, uh, whatever. Uh, this is the channel that you have to subscribe to. Uh, absolutely, right? You got to love it, right? Of course, we, we all talk sense here. And of course, uh, yeah, just subscribe, like, share, do whatever. Okay, obviously, there are tons and tons of questions already. Let's get to those before we lose out on some of them. CEC Healthcare at 456, problem with Indian experience, employer not active, but genuine experience in cash. Should I skip this and sit at 430 or 456 for the next draw? You know what I would have done? I would have gone and sat at 456. And the reason why I would sit at a higher score is uh, then I have a little bit of leeway of playing around with this. So what will happen is if the score is at, let's say, 440, and then I know I cannot go to 430. So I will continue with my 456. I will provide the documentation to the best of my effort because you're saying it's a genuine work experience. And then I go with that. I'll take a chance with that. Okay. If it works in my favor, good enough. Uh, because, and if at all the scores are down, scores are below at 425, 428, then what I will do is I will remove this work experience. I will be safe at 430 and I will go with that. Make sense? Go with that. Uh, Shah, I'm sorry, there's no question there. I'm sorry, I do not know how to pronounce your first name. Uh, Nishan says, I've got ITA in STEM category under NOC 21321, industrial engineer. I do not have a professional degree license. Does this affect my application or P engineering is mandatory? It is not. In express entry, and, and I know this is pretty surprising and pretty shocking because most people will not tell you this. In express entry, uh, the visa officers have an operational manual. And in the operational manual, they have been told, and I, I wish I could find it for you right now. It'll take me a little bit of time. But if you research this, you will find it on the RSCC website. And actually, you will find it on my blog as well. If you go onto my blog, and if you check, uh, does your work experience have to be in the same field of study? If you find that uh, blog of mine, or even my, my, my last YouTube video, I've done it a few months, years back. In that, there is a link. And if you see that link, it says that the visa officer does not have to uh, assess the employment requirements of the NOC code for express entry. So what that means is what you're talking about is the requirement of education, requirement of licensing that all comes up under the employment requirement of the NOC code. For express entry, the visa officer is not going to assess it. Therefore, you do not have a problem with it. Uh, RCC is not going to hold it against you that uh, you do not have a professional engineer license or P engineering uh, to be eligible under your knock code of 21321. So by all means, please continue. You will have no issues at all. Don't you think it's pretty cool to be on this channel, right? You get all this kind of valuable information. All right. <laughs> Narain says, my CRS is 511, got ITA in system draw as non-accompanying spouse. Spouse is having less CELPIP score. Can't add her to my profile. Can I add her while my process is under, while my PR is under process with her new CELPIP score? Uh, unfortunately not. Why? Because at the time you submit your application and you get your AOR, everything is locked. So while you can make changes to your family composition, for example, you can say my spouse was not accompanying, my spouse will accompany now. But at this point of time, you can now not add uh, relevant points for language or relevant points for education. That cannot be considered. Okay. Uh, so if any points have to be considered, they will only be considered before your AOR. So if your spouse has to improve her CELPIP scores, she should do it now 
before you submit your application. After that, yes, you can have them add your spouse, but they will not be able to update your scores with your new self it scores kind of thing because the date of the self it score would be after the AOR and therefore it's not acceptable. And hence, uh, if you need to make any changes to your application with regards to your spouse being added with the CELPIP scores or IELTS scores, then you must do it before the application is being submitted. I hope that helps. Okay, uh, Honda says, came to Canada with an LMIA closed work permit for a Quebec employer, valid till August 2025. Since LMIA is related to Quebec, am I eligible to claim LMI points in my express entry profile or should I proceed as CEC candidate only? Very good question. But the thing is, this is one huge gray area to which I do not have a clear answer. Now, this is how it is. Express entry. In express entry, you have to express your intention to reside outside Quebec. Okay. Everything should direct towards the fact that you want to live outside Quebec. If you are claiming points for a job offer in Quebec, the reason you are getting the points is because you have an arranged employment with that employer. If that employer is in Quebec and this employment is for a future date, which basically means you will be living in Quebec to perform that job for this employer, this is the reason you're getting those points, which is in direct contradiction with the requirement that you live outside Quebec. Your intention should be to live outside Quebec. So therefore, as I said, it's a gray area. I do not have a clear answer for you, but I've explained to you where the contradiction is. If you wish to continue with this, by all means do. You can always request the employer to give you a letter saying that once you become a PR, they intend to move you to a different province or that they intend to open a new branch or, or whatever that might require to move you to a different uh, province or to move you to a different city outside Quebec. Maybe it will work if you are because at the end of the day, the law says that your intention, intention has to be to reside outside Quebec. That is what is needed. And if you can establish that, if you can prove that, then the chances are you might just get through. Chance for you to take. Mohit says, uh, I have a visa refusal as a dependent child 12 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Should I disclose it in my express entry application? Second question is, considering every draw IRCC calls 2000 person, mathematically speaking, scores will never drop will scores ever drop to 490s okay uh, first question you have to disclose all visa refusals even if they were at a time when you were a baby so yes please disclose all visa refusals uh, to your ne next question if IRCC invites only 2000 people uh, will the scores ever drop to 490s then the answer to that is no if IRCC continues with only 2,000 invitations in each draw with two weeks gap, then the scores will never come down to 490s. Actually, the scores might not even drop below 420s, 430s in that case. But it is my opinion, only opinion, that uh, IRCC at some stage will go over the 2,000 mark for sure. Uh, they did, they almost did that a couple of weeks back. I'm hoping that they continue with that and, and we see a better draw in times to come. Yes says, am I eligible for OINP employer job offer FSW if my two years of work experience is in Canada and my offer letter is three year old? Huh? Does getting just a new offer letter with the recent date in the same job work? Yeah, of course it will work. I mean, that's what you need. Three year old, it will not work. Ontario needs a more recent uh, document. Plus you need the employer form. So if your employer is ready to give you the employer form, why won't he give you the recent job offer, right? So yeah, please get a recent job offer. It's always better to go with that. Three-year-old might be too old, to be very honest. Uh, therefore, get a most recent uh, job offer. Plus, also bear in mind that your salary, your wages, have to meet the median wage for that knock code for that geographic location that you are in. Uh, Postgraduate work permit expired on the 14th, got ITA at 491. But I am on maintained status with fake extension. Can I submit PR documents and apply for bridge open work permit? Yes, absolutely you can. There is no problem with that. Uh, I did a video for this just a few days back. I'm not sure if you saw that one. Uh, the conditions of a bridge open work permit. Let's take a look at that. Okay, uh, let me hide this. And let me... Okay, so 
uh, you can apply for uh, permanent resident using express entry. So that's what you're going to do, apply in express entry. And if you applied for express entry, these instructions are for federal skill worker, Canadian experience class, federal skill trade category. To be eligible to apply for bridge open work permit, you must be living in Canada. That's the first thing. Uh, you can leave Canada while we process your application. So that's fine, but you should be living in Canada when you submit at the time you apply for your bridge open work permit and you have to be intending to live outside Quebec, of course. And either, okay, you have a valid work permit. In your case, you don't. You have a fake extension. Have an expired work permit, but maintained your status as a worker. This is the most important. Because you applied for fake extension, it basically meant that you are now on a maintained status as a worker because you applied for fake extension of a work permit extension. So you are still on a maintained status as a worker. Therefore, with this condition itself, you have the eligibility to apply for a bridge open work permit. Okay, uh, for people who lose their status and change it to a visitor or have a visitor record, those people are not eligible to apply for bridge open work permit. For the third one, it says be eligible to restore your status and get a work permit, not restore your status for a work permit, restore your status and get a work permit, which if you applied for fake extension that has been refused, you have applied for visitor record or you are now on a visitor record. Those people cannot apply for bridge open work permit because they do not meet these conditions. I hope that helps. Okay. <clears throat> Currently working in Canada as a software engineer, my employer applied for GTS LMIA resume submitted with LMIA application is outdated. Does ESDC perform background check for applicants before decision? No, they don't. They ESDC is only interested in the employer. They are not interested in the candidate. Sometimes they are, but not, not largely. Their interest is with the employer. Is the employer satisfying all the conditions of uh, employment, all the conditions of having a genuine uh, job, and that they could not find any other Canadian or permanent resident who could fit into that job role? So, yeah, that's the answer for you. Can I remove my work experience post ITA and move to personal history? Yes, you can. As long as that change or as that move of work experience from your work history to personal history does not reduce your score and does not impact your eligibility point for federal skill worker. A lot of people forget about this, right? So what happens is that either you're a federal skill worker or you're Canadian experience class or you're a federal skill trade category. Now, if you're a Canadian experience class, then you don't have to worry about the federal skill worker eligibility point. But if you are a federal skilled worker, then by making these changes from your work experience to personal history, you could be putting yourself in a very serious trouble because it might be impacting your eligibility score. Now, as a federal skilled worker, you also need to be eligible in express entry by scoring 67 points on the six selection factor uh, attributes. So please bear in mind that if you are a federal skilled worker doing this change, making all these changes, you must be aware that it should not impact your eligibility score of 67. Uh, I am a spouse and don't have Canadian tier work experience to claim points for. I showed all my foreign and Canadian experience while creating a profile. Okay. Okay. Uh, wife's work permit has restriction not to study in career college, but in general, open work permit holders can study up to six months. Huh? Okay. Also, she had her 18 work. 18 months open work permit extension to 30th June. Can she do six months course? But in general, open work permit hold. Yeah, you can. I mean, if it's it, so basically what they are saying is that you cannot study in a regular career college for a program more than six months. So even as a visitor, if you're visiting Canada, if you choose to study in Canada as while being on a visitor visa, you can as long as the duration of that study program is six months and less. So yes, you should be able to do it. I'm on an open work permit. My wife is on a closed work permit via ICT. I'm working as a customer service rep and want to know if I can apply for extension of work permit, even if my wife goes back to home country. The thing is, in order for you to apply for your open work permit, one of the important documents that you need is one, your wife's work permit copy, of course, and that has to be valid, number one. Number two, your wife's current employment letter, which says this is her job roles and responsibility, working hours, salary and her three most recent pay stubs. That's what you need. Only then will you be able to apply for an extension. So if your wife is planning to go back home, 
before she goes back home, apply for your work permit extension. It doesn't matter when it is expiring. You can apply for the extension. Your work permit will be extended to the validity same as your spouse's work permit validity. And therefore, you can continue to work uh, for whatever the period of time your validity is. Uh, Upender Singh says, I came with ICT work permit NOC 21222, but my duty is mostly matched with 21231 and with work extension, it's updated as well. Can I use 21231 for all experience of 10 years? Did you work in Canada for 10 years? The point is, yes, you can. And you can always add a letter of explanation because if you came to Canada a few years back, then you had a four-digit knock code. That four-digit knock code is what you were uh, given a work permit with. And there is a possibility that that may have deviated into different knock codes. As long as you can explain what you are performing. And it seems that 21231 and 21222 might have an overlap, might have a you know uh, uh, duties which were probably... Uh, mixed there you can always make an explanation so as long as your duties and responsibilities are pretty much the same or similar and overlapping you should be able to get away with it and for your other work experiences for all of your first of all you don't need 10 years right at most if it's foreign work experience three years canadian work experience you can go up to five years anything more than that you don't really need but yeah you can technically if you want to go with that yes 10 years you can absolutely depending you can choose that knock code if it matches with the job description and your job roles and responsibilities in man in montreal on closed work permit lmi exempt planning to apply for express entry or cec basically it's not different it's the same cec is in express entry okay so you're applying for canadian experience as a canadian experience class what proof is needed for intent to move out of quebec uh if selected and copr given do i have to move out immediately well you should move out at the earliest if you can if you can't then you provide uh, different documentation to show that you want to move out probably have your employer give you in writing that they will move you out of the province at some point of time once you become a pr but you will have to express your intention to move out of quebec and uh, you can get a notarized affidavit you can have your employer give it to you in writing uh, you can write an explanation that once you become a PR, then you will move out. But yes, you would have to express your intention. Uh, Saksham says, how many pay stubs should I show under CEC? If I'm already showing T4s and notice of assessment, I got my ITA, did upfront medicals before submission. As I wasn't aware of new medical regulations, what should I do? Well, if you have already done your uh, medicals upfront, provide it. No problem. Don't worry about it. As far as uh, pay stubs is concerned, I prefer to provide 12 months of pay stubs and the reason for that is let me also just tell you that is your t4s and notice of assessment does not indicate the hours that you have worked your pay stub does okay and sometimes ircc just wants to ensure that you did actually work for 30 hours a week uh, shouldn't have been less or you know compensated at other points of time your t4s just show your uh, annual income that you are be that you were to be uh, paying taxes for or for your tax purposes your notice of assessment shows what you're claiming in terms of your income it doesn't nowhere does it show the the uh, bi-weekly or weekly hours and that's where pay stubs become very important so if i was you i i mean if i am handling any application for my clients i usually prefer to add for at least 12 months I recently used chat GPT to compare and analyze my existing roles, responsibilities against the duties and responsibilities as per the ESDC's tier code, got detailed analysis results. Should I include this analysis during my PR application? Yes, of course, you can. No problem with that. What you can do is you can uh, add it as part of your letter of explanation. I would, I would try to paraphrase it and not give the exact chat GPT uh, text, but yes, you can. Would my part-time work experience during studies count towards my CRS? Is ONP still a good pathway? No, your work experience while you are studying does not count for express entry. Absolutely not. Uh, even on co-op work permit, it does not count. Only from the day you applied for your postgraduate work permit, only that work experience counts. Any work experience while you were studying, while you were in a study permit, while you were in a co-op work permit, internship, etc. does not count. Only after you have applied for your postgraduate work permit, that work experience, if you were paid, counts. Uh, is OINP still a good pathway? Listen, any pathway is a good pathway if you can get invited and if you are able to submit your application. So not for a minute would I think any pathway is not a good pathway. I think all pathways are good pathways because eventually all of them give an opportunity to somebody to become a permanent resident. So as far as I'm concerned, all pathways are good. You need to figure out 
uh, if they work for you, if they are good for you. So you need to be eligible. You need to be able to get all the documentation in place. You need to be get you need to get invited and then submit your PR application. Does PSW or medical office AC assistant fall under healthcare or STEM? Well, honestly, I don't remember every single knock code out there or the category code. So you will need to go on the IRCC website. Uh, look for the category based draws, click on each category, see all the knock codes that are there and then see if your knock code is included or not. I have one year of experience where I have worked for six months as data analyst and rest six months as software developer. Can I combine that as one year of experience and human Ontario's human capital tech? Well, if this is inside Canada, yes, you can. If it is outside Canada, no, you can't. Because outside Canada, work experience, for as a federal skilled worker, it has to be as per the primary knock code. And primary knock code, you need at least one year of work experience. If this is inside Canada, CEC, then you can. Does it help? Ritesh says, if I have both permit, postgraduate work permit and spouse open work permit, can I still continue to work? Huh? Uh, well, listen, it doesn't matter whether you have spouse work permit or postgraduate work permit. As long as you have any of the valid work permits, you can continue working. It does not matter whether your spouse is studying, not studying, your spouse is working, not working. You may have received your open work permit based on your spouse's uh, status in Canada. But what is happening with your spouse in terms of their status does not impact your status. As long as your work permit is valid, you can absolutely continue working. There is no issues there. Having five months of ongoing work experience in trade category, can I expect IT in the up upcoming week? No, you. I mean, system may give it to you, but you need to make sure that you have six months of work experience. And if the K category draw happens, and if you are found to be eligible, then you might just get that invitation. But you need six months of work experience to be able to submit that application. Can I choose not to show my Canadian education to lower my CRS points for the human capital? My current CRS is 436. Well, technically, yes, you can. It, it's not a problem. Just the way you can claim points, you can unclaim points as well or choose not to claim points. That is also a possibility, equal possibility. Uh, nothing there. I have 468 CRS in healthcare and completed one year course in Canada. Should I expect to get ITA by December? I don't want to do another course. I don't know. Well, if there are healthcare draw happens and if 468 gets invited, you surely should expect one. And if not through Express Entry Healthcare, then I probably Ontario's. I think, yeah, 468 is a pretty good score for healthcare. Employer gave T4 to avoid 1.5 XP. Should I include second T4? That is from another company in my PR application. It is only $1,300 combined. To be very honest, I don't really know what you mean by that. But if you have a, even if you have two T4s, it doesn't matter because your notice of assessment will reflect the total amount of claim. So yes, if you have two T4s, please add them. Came to Canada on a visitor before one year and got work permit. Work permit is expiring next month. Also applied for extension. Don't know about the decision. Visitor is valid. Can I stay if no status? No, you cannot. You see, when you applied for a work permit, earlier when you came to Canada, you were a visitor, right? You came to Canada, you were given a status of a visitor. Then you changed your status to a worker by applying for a work permit. Now, once your work permit is refused, the extension is refused, you lose status. You do not automatically become a visitor because you have a valid TRB. Please bear this in mind. Please understand this, that the counterfoil that is on your passport is a visa for you to enter Canada. Once you enter Canada, then you are given a status. You could be a visitor, you could be a student, you could be a worker. All right. That is how you get your status. You were given a status of a visitor, then you changed it to a worker. Now, if you lose your status as a worker, you don't have status. So you need to apply for change of status and therefore you will apply for a visitor record. Please bear that in mind. You do not automatically get a status as a visitor. Uh, oh, sorry. Got this one here first. I got a job in New Brunswick. I already have two years work experience in Ontario. If I move to New Brunswick, can I apply under AIP program? How long will it take to get my ITA? Can I come back to Ontario after I get my ECU gap? Can I change employer in New Brunswick? Oh, that's a lot of questions. First of all, if you apply under AIP program, you are applying because you have a job offer from the employer in Atlantic. And therefore, 
the idea is because you are getting a job offer, you are applying under the AIP program, the idea should be to stay in that province once you do get approved. Uh, and therefore, you should, and there is no ITA. Okay, you have the job offer, you get the endorsement from the province for Atlantic uh, immigration program, and then you apply for PR uh, under the AIP. There is no ITA, so you apply directly. Uh, the whole process from getting the endorsement, which will take about three to four months, and then the PR application can take about six to eight months, about a year for the total process. Ideally, you know, stick back because you're getting your PR through that program in New Brunswick. Stick back there because if you move, you're making it more difficult for everybody else. And, and such kind of activity, such, such kind of actions spoil it for everybody else, you know, because then the employers don't trust them. The province doesn't trust them. The system doesn't trust them. Plus, you are... Uh, yeah, don't do it. It's not a good thing, first of all. Technically and by law, can it be a problem? Well, you are applying under the Atlantic Immigrant Pro Immigration Program. It's not a PNP program. So, if you are not signing any document to say that I will, my intention is to reside in this province, then technically there is nothing that holds you back. So, that's the law. Deep says, asking for a friend, his postgraduate work permit expired, now applying for spouse open work permit plus restoration. Can he travel outside Canada while the application is in progress? Yes, he can. But if he does that, then he loses his implied status and he may re-enter Canada. Uh, but actually, you said he's expired and now applying for restoration. So if you're applying for restoration, yes, absolutely leave Canada, go back, does not have status anyways. Once the spouse open work permit is approved, then you can come back. Or if you have a TRV, you can come back. You are a visitor and once your spouse open work permit is approved, then you can start working again. But you cannot work in this period. My primary knock is 21231. All my work history knock codes are 21232. I forgot to update the primary knock code. I got an IT and STEM draw. What it will be the reason for rejection? No, it is not a reason for rejection. Simply go and make the changes to your primary knock code, to your work experience. Please make sure everything is in order. As long as all the information that you have mentioned is correct, complete, uh, it should not be a problem. You can make those changes. That is not an issue. Just provide correct documentation that validate the choice of your NOC code. <sighs> Sorry, Ashish, there is no question here. Uh, Karthik says, I passed medical exam, received PAL. Can I leave Canada before getting received PAL? PAL is for study permit. So are we talking about study permit? And you're asking getting P1 reply to come back. Okay, you're confusing me. PAL is for study permits, provincial attestation letters. I do not know what PAL you are referring to. But if you're talking about your permanent residence application, then once you get the confirmation of your PR asking whether you're inside Canada, if you have a visa to come back to Canada, then yes, you can come back to Canada and, and then you can reply back and say that you are inside Canada so that they can then proceed with your portal request and send you the portal request. Mind you, they usually do not give you too much of time. Nowadays, they're giving you a time of seven days to reply to that email. So if you can return back in seven days, then yes, by all means do. Otherwise, you can always reply back to them and say you are outside Canada and give them the expected or anticipated date when you plan to return back to Canada. Guys, please do not do super chats. I will not be able to complete it and then you will not like it either. I have claimed that my spouse, Wes, was completed an e-profile while it was still in progress and I received notification of interest. Now the Wes is completed. Can I update my spouse, Wes, number in profile and accept Ontario? To be very honest, what you did is not good. It's not the right thing to do. These things are what creates a problem. When you did not have your spouse's Wes, how did you claim points for it? Means you put a, a different number, which was not true. And now the date of your Wes is after the date you created your profile, after the date that you have received the notification of interest. So these things create problems. Please do not do these things. Okay. Uh, anyways, for your Ontario, your spouse's Wes is not required. They don't ask for it. So yeah, but please don't do these kind of things. Just have patience instead. You know, you would get an invitation later on. But uh, yeah, that's not the way to go about this. For Express Entry Profile, it is a requirement that you already mention the date and mention the correct number when you're creating the profile. That's how you get the points for it. Currently on visitor record, one year Canadian experience, one year Canadian education, both in Ontario, CRS is 484. Am I eligible to receive Ontario's tech draw if I leave Canada to visit India? Yes, even if you are not in Canada, 
you will still be eligible for the tech draw in Ontario. There is nothing in Ontario's tech draw which says you cannot be outside Canada or that you have to be in Canada. People who are outside Canada also regularly receive invitations and become eligible. So there is no problem. You can absolutely travel. No issues there at all. My score is 501 general category without LMIA work permit expiring August. I wait or try LMIA to increase my score to 551. I think you can wait for a month at most, but I would start looking for options. If, if LMIA is an option for you, then I would start looking and having that option available and ready so that come July, I'm able to cash in on it. I serve my notice period remotely from Canada for an Indian employer while working in Canada. Overlap in the work history or terms of closed work permit. Any concern? No, there is no concern as such. It's just that while you are in Canada, your work experience outside Canada does not count. So you, you do not get foreign work experience points for work experience outside Canada while you are in Canada uh, on a different work permit. So yeah, apart from that, overlap is not a problem. Middle name on West report, slightly different from passport. How to address that in an express entry application? It's not an issue. Just make a one and same person affidavit and just... Uh, uh, provided to IRCC saying that there is a name variation. It's not a problem at all. Can I reappear and change my CELPIP score post ITA after submitting the PR application as non-accompanying spouse? Can I add my spouse through web form later with a new spouse CELPIP? I think we already discussed that. You can't do that. It will not be accepted. If you provide any change in scores of your CELPIP or your VES or whatever that might be, after you submit the application, it is not accepted. Your application will get refused if your new score is below the drawn score. Do you think 75 CRS CEC like 2021 can happen? Well, anything can happen, but I don't think it will happen. Uh, that was a disaster. That was absolutely a disaster what they did. I, I, in my opinion, it can, it should not, it should not happen. Of course, anything can happen. It's IRCC. Of course, they have a brain of their own, right? If my fake work permit extension is refused, guys, do not do super chat. Kayur Patel, Kayur Patel, Abhijit Vishwanath, Ashish Shukla. I will not be taking these questions. I've already told you, do not do super chats. I will not be answering these questions. Kindly, please do not do super chats. Komal says, if my fake work permit is extension is refused, can I still continue working in my bridge open work permit? Permit extension was submitted before the refusal. If not, when can I start working? So you applied for your fake extension. You then applied for your bridge open work permit. Your implied status is because of your fake extension. Because of the fake extension, you were also able to apply for your bridge open work permit. However, the authorization to work during your maintained status only comes from your fake extension. The minute that fake extension is refused, you have to stop working. Just before you applied, just because you applied for bridge open work permit does not mean your maintained status continues. No, it does not it ends at the time your fake extension is refused. Yes, you can continue staying in Canada, but you have lost your authority to work and therefore you have to stop working immediately once your fake extension is refused. You can only start working again after your bridge open work permit is approved and or if your post, uh, your permanent residence application is approved. Uh, nothing here, Dinesh. Passport expires in March. I plan to apply for PNP in August. Work permit expires in December. When should I renew my passport given that I might receive my ITA before December? You can apply for your passport at any point of time. When you have it, use the web form and you can provide it to IRCC to update it in the system. No problem there, Lavish. My one year postgraduate work permit expires in November. Uh, I will be still short of one month for my one year of Canadian work experience. With this work experience, my CRS points will shoot up. Probability getting probability of getting ITA. Any probable way to get this one month of work experience, sir? Yeah, fake extension. That's what people are doing, right? Right now. Uh, that's not the best option, to be very honest. Ideally, you, ideally you should uh, try to get an LMIA. But hey, uh, if you apply for an extension... You get implied status because you get implied status you are on a legal valid status and legally you can work because you can work legally because you're on a legal valid maintained status therefore that work experience counts um, if ircc takes one month or more to decide then you have your one month of experience if they don't then you're tough out of luck there uh nothing there ashish shukla I got relocation to Canada on
I'm sorry, I will not answer this question, will not answer this question, will not answer this question, will not answer the question. Guys, please, you know, when I'm saying don't do super chats, please don't do super chats because I will not be able to complete them. Just, just don't do that, please. Thank you. Uh, I got relocation to Toronto and on Canadian payroll in human resources staffing manager. While whether I have to file my application for ONP separately or express entry is enough, score is 501. I honestly don't understand your question. Uh, if you are eligible in uh, express entry, you will get invited in express entry. If your employer is willing to support you for the OINP's uh, federal skill, uh, sorry, foreign worker program, then you will be able to apply under the, uh, you will need to create your account on the Ontario portal and you will be able to apply through that if you are invited and if your employer supports you. Uh, if you are interested in the Ontario's uh, human capital priority stream, they don't really invite human resource staffing managers. At least I haven't seen that knock code in a long time. But you don't need to do anything different for human capital priority stream. You only need to have your express entry profile. Your primary knock code should be that knock code. And if they are interested, then they will invite you through that knock code. Best province option for transport coordinator roles for PR. There is no such thing as best province for transport coordinator roles. Any province which gives you that job, any employer that supports your application for PNP, that would be a good one. Okay, guys, you know, these four, Kayur, Amrinder Singh, Vishal, Tech Talk. I, I, I hate this fact that I, uh, uh, I have these and I do not want to ignore them because it's not a nice thing to do. I will do them. Please do not do any more Super Chats. I really, really request you not to do that okay so let's take from this one upwards so that anything below this we will not have right i got ita through international student stream the knock code in my noi was wrong and my correct knock code reduced the score but above cutoff i put loe hoping for the best if the new knock code was also included then you should be fine as long as you explained to ontario you will be fine with that uh, because the score is above the cutoff and your new knock code also included, so you'll be fine with that. I'm waiting for the PNP or express entry draw on applied status. In skilled labor, what should I do next when refusal comes for a work permit extension? Well, you will be out of status. Change your status to uh, restore your status and change your status to a visitor. That's what you can do. Yeah. That's, that's the only thing you can do. Of course, you can also leave Canada and go back to your home country. But if you want to stay in Canada, then you must restore your status and change it to a vis visitor because you can't restore your status as a worker. So you need to apply for a change of status along with that as well. So sketch one, India recruitment mission. I got an ITA in this with 60 score. They have called for an interview from SASC job. Is this immigration interview or job interview? How will it affect profile? Well, congratulations. This is amazing. Uh, so Saskatchewan conducts these recruitment missions uh, on an on an uh, ad hoc basis in different locations. And if you had if they had found your profile in any of your or any of the portals in, in your case from SAS job, then they would conduct an interview to validate your work experience and your education. And if that is as per your profile that you have indicated, then uh, you would be able to submit your application for nomination and from that your PR application. So congratulations, good one. Uh, as I said, most important thing would be the factors about your work experience and your education. If I am on maintained status and my postgraduate work permit is expiring, can I apply for visitor visa as I don't have TRV? What can I do? Uh, unfortunately not. If you do not have a valid study permit or a work permit, inside Canada, you cannot apply for TRV. So in order to apply for TRV, you have to be outside Canada. That application has to be made from outside Canada. So, yeah, all you can do is, uh, no, you can't do anything. You, you can't apply for a TRV. Uh, once you lose your status, you can apply for a visitor record by applying for restoration of status. But that's pretty much all you can do with the status. Or, of course, as you can leave Canada and then apply for TRV from outside Canada. Okay, uh, there was one particular question there. Seem to have missed it. Uh, seem to have missed it. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining in. 
it is lovely catching up again on this particular episode of Canadian Immigration Le Canadian Immigration Weekly Roundup. Uh, stay safe, take care, and if you are in Dubai, come visit us. We are at the one central Dubai near World Trade Center. This is the offices building level three. I somehow have. I'm going to write the address in the description box. But yes, if you're in Dubai, come visit us. We'll be happy to have a word with you. Probably look for any options that might work for you. But until then, we'll meet you again. We'll see you again. We'll do this again next week. Probably post some more videos. Therefore, subscribe to the channel, like, share, and then yeah, join us again next week. And stay safe, take care. Good night.